Hi, I'm Kristen. Welcome to the Dye School, where I teach you how to hand dye all the things to color your world. Today, I will show you how to ice dye cotton canvas using only primary colors of MX Fiber Reactive dyes. I will mix four different dye colors using formulas and apply them to the fabric. This is a sexy close-up of the finished fabric. The dye colors have a watercolor effect because of the action of the melting ice on the flow of the dye. I dye this fabric to sew into a fanny pack. It helps me a lot to dye with a specific end project in mind. Otherwise, I find the fabric or yarn ends up sitting in my stash forever waiting for a project. When I dye for a specific project, I keep the momentum and excitement all the way through to the finished item. There's a separate video that shows me sewing the fanny pack. I have put the link in the description box below. Check that out to see the fabric in action. This is the fabric I used for the project. I don't remember where I bought this. It might have been from fabric.com. I'm not sure, but I bought an entire bolt of 20 yards. It's a medium weight, 9.3 ounce, 100% cotton duck canvas, and it's 58 to 60 inches wide. James Thompson and Company is the manufacturer. I'm flagrantly disregarding that it says dry clean only. That's funny. I'm going to dunk that sucker in hot water pretty soon. And it's no lie that it may shrink up to 10%. It totally did that. Normally I pre-wash fabric in my washing machine before I dye it, but I completely spaced that in this case and simply pre-washed a half a yard in the sink in hot water and synthropol which is a detergent specifically made for dyers. It's formulated to remove sizing, which is a stiffener added to fabrics to make it more appealing to consumers, uh, spinning and weaving oils, dirt, and general crud that may resist the dye reaction. I want a nice, clean, blank slate for easy dyeing. I gently squeeze the excess water out of the fabric and put it aside in a bucket for later. Next, I mix the soda ash solution. Soda ash, which is also called sodium carbonate, is the agent that makes the MX fiber reactive dyes attached to the cotton fibers. The soda ash raises the pH of the dye solution, helping the dye reaction to happen. The ratio for the soda ash solution is one cup of powder to one gallon of water. I make a one gallon solution of soda ash by mixing one cup of powdered soda ash with about a pint of hot water taken from the one gallon total. I stir it continuously until the powder dissolves and then pour into the remaining water. Pro tip, if you don't use hot water and stir vigor vigorously, you end up with a big undissolved chunk of soda ash in the bottom of your container. My pre-washed, still damp fabric has been waiting patiently in a bucket. I put it into the soda ash solution to soak for about 20 minutes, making sure that it is fully submerged so that the soda ash soaks into the fabric evenly. The soda ash solution keeps indefinitely, so I will use it to soak other fabrics and clothing blanks that I dye in the future. Squeeze out excess liquid and put the fabric into a bucket. I took this fabric outside to my clothesline and hung it up to drip dry. Usually I wait until the fabric is totally dry before I fold it and dye it, but I was impatient this time and the fabric was still a little damp when I took it off the line. There are four colors I will mix to put on the fabric. 
teal, purple, green, and grello, which is what I call a greenish yellow. The formulas are from samples I dyed previously that are in my dye sample library. One of the big bonuses of mixing dyes this way is that the colors are easily reproducible on any quantity of fabric. Uh, for the MX fiber reactive dyes, I use mostly single chemical unmixed primary dye powders. First, I need to know how much total dye I need for each color. To figure that, I multiply the weight of the dry fabric in grams, which is 200 grams, by the DOS or depth of shade, which is simply how dark or light the color is. 2% DOS is a medium shade for the MX fiber reactive dyes, so I choose that. So the WOG or weight of goods times the DOS or depth of shade is 200 grams times 0.02 or 4 grams total dye. Now it's a little fudgy here because 4 grams would dye the whole 200 gram piece of fabric a single color at 2% depth of shade and I'm using 4 colors. I took into account that there would be dye color loss during the ice dyeing, that I want dark and light variations of each color on the fabric, and the canvas fabric itself is dye hungry. FYI, my main supplier for dyes is Pro Chemical in Massachusetts in the United States, so the color numbers I reference for each component dye are their color numbers. For each color mixture then, the total dye powder is 4 grams. Each formula has a different percentage of a primary dye color, primary color dye powder to make up the color. I'll use teal as the example of how I figure the amount of each component dye. Teal is 70% yellow 114 and 30% blue 402C. To figure out the amount of yellow, I take the total dye, which is 4 grams, and multiply it by 0.7 which is the decimal expression of 70%, and get 2.8 grams of yellow 114. I do the same for the blue. 4 grams total dye times 0.3 is 1.2 grams of blue 402C. I know this is correct because the amount of yellow, 2.8 grams, plus the amount of blue, 1.2 grams, equals 4 grams, which is my total amount of dye. I do the calculations for each color. The purple is 50% red 305 and 50% blue 402C, which is easy to figure at 2 grams for each primary color. Green is 60% yellow 108 and 40% blue 402C. Grello is 95% yellow 108 and 5% blue 402C. It's a simple task of multiplying 4 grams total dye times each of those decimals decimal percentages to get the total of each primary dye powder. I depend on my sample library to reference dye colors. These are samples I made previously on a white quilting type cotton fabric. I staple the formulas to the samples so that I can recreate the colors on different fabrics. The colors will shift slightly because the sample fabric is different from the canvas plus the samples were dyed using a different technique that is not ice dyed like the canvas will be. But the colors will come out virtually the same. This is why I love formula dyeing. Because I have dyed samples of these formulas already, there's no guessing, no finger crossing, no wasted fabric or dyes, and no murky mystery colors. As a side note, I make some random gestures in the video that don't quite coincide with audio because I decided to do voiceover at the last minute instead of using the native audio from the footage because there were some odd background noises I couldn't edit out. This diagram shows the approximate placement of each color. I went a little bit off-road from this diagram though since the fold was not 24 inches wide like the diagram shows. The cut piece was a half a yard so that's 18 inches. Each fold is about 4 inches wide, accordion folded on itself. You'll see, see that in the subsequent footage. The basic plan stayed the same though. It was an accordion fold with offset closed pins that alternated sides. The smaller rectangles with the forked ends in the diagram are the closed pins, 
While I keep close track of my color formulas, this part of my record keeping is hit or miss, especially when I decide to change things on the fly. Good thing there's video proof, or else I would have really no idea what I did at this point. Here's the accordion folded fabric clipped with giant wooden clothespins. These clothespins are way bigger and grippier than the tiny wimpy ones you can get in local stores. I think I found these on Amazon. I'm not sure of the vendor. You can see the layers of folded fabric on top of each other. I'm clipping the clothespins on opposite sides, offset from each other. The folding and the pinching of the clothespins will create a slight resist for the dies, so there will be a subtle pattern on the dyed fabric. I put the fabric in this plastic gridded basket. I bought it at Dollar Tree or some other discount retail store. I think it's made for papers because it's about the size of a U.S. letter-sized piece of paper. The open grid will allow water from the melting ice to collect in a container below the basket. My fabric is a little longer than the basket, so I fit it in diagonally and scrunch it up a little bit to make it fit. Now I'm setting up to weigh dye powder for each color. Off camera, I'm wearing a respirator to keep from inhaling dye powder. This handy gram scale is available for under $20 at multiple online retailers. It has grams, ounces, and carats in case you want to weigh your crown jewels as well as your dye powder. I use a weighing boat on top of the scale to protect the surface of the scale and to contain the dye powder. The weighing boat is a sort of small, lightweight plastic tray. I tear the scale to subtract the weight of the boat before I start weighing powder. You might be curious why I don't use teaspoons to measure the dye. Like I said in the beginning, I like to be able to recreate my colors, and since each dye powder has a different volume from another, using teaspoons isn't as exacting as I want to be in my dye practice. I find it easier and more accurate to use a gram scale. I use plastic tags to mark, mark each small container so I can keep track of which of the four colors is which. Dye powder mixtures seldom look like the resulting color so it's hard to tell what color is what unless I mark them. I tap out the amounts of each primary color and put them in small plastic containers. I mix the two component colors together so each color is a homogeneous mix of the two primaries. I have the formulas and the amounts of each dye powder to weigh out written on index cards so I remember how much I need of each color. I have the color numbers of each dye powder written on the lid so they're easy to find in the storage container I use. I make certain to close the lids after I'm done with each container to avoid spillage and cross-contamination. Dye powder has a way of floating around without you seeing it, so work in a draft-free area and wear a respirator. For this batch of ice dyed fabric, I put the dye over the top of the ice. You can also put the dye on the fabric first and then put the, dice, put the ice on. You get a slightly different look each way, even if every other variable is the same. This bag of ice came from my local grocery store and it's pretty irregular. I'm not sure what kind of ice machine they have. Some of the chunks looked like they were chipped out of a frozen pond or something. I moved the chunks around so that the ice is concentrated over the top of the fabric. I want all the fabric to be covered with ice chunks. Wearing a respirator, I start to tap the mixed dye powder on top of the ice with a plastic spoon. I clearly weighed out the dye powder formulas for each color off camera, so I have four plastic cups with the dye powder in them for each color, green, purple, teal, and grello. I stir the pri two primary dye colors together in each cup to make a uniform mixture. As the ice melts, the dye powder hits the surface of the fabric at different times, causing the resulting colors to be light and dark and blended together with the other colors in places. The water from the melting ice turns the dye powder to liquid that seeps through the folded fabric.
I put the basket over the top of an enclosed container to catch the water. I put the containers outside to melt because it was between 70 and 80 degrees Fahrenheit outside. This video footage is after four hours have passed. During that time, it had started raining, which I didn't really mind about. You can see that the dye water from the melted ice is in the container below the basket. This footage is after about six and a half hours. You can see that all the ice is melted and there, there's still some pasty unreacted dye on the surface that will rinse away. I take the clips off and open it out a little for a sneak preview. Note that the colors will be lighter when the fabric is rinsed and dried. From here, I took the fabric inside to the sink. The first rinse is in cold water to remove any unreacted dye. Gradually, I increase the amount of warm water in the rinse. I add synthropol, which you will remember is the dyer's detergent, and let the fabric sit in warm water for about 20 minutes. Then I continue to rinse in warm running water until the water is clear. And then I hang the fabric outside on the clothesline to dry. And here again is the finished fabric reveal. This is dry, obviously. And you can see the areas where it has been folded, or it was folded, and um, some areas where the clothespins were. And this is a sneak peek of the fanny pack that I made with this fabric. It features a leather tassel that I also made and a belt that is literally made from a belt that I got at a thrift store that miraculously matches perfectly. So if you want to check that out, look in the description below to see me sewing that. Thanks for watching.